Well, the title of the message today, in sync with the lighting of the candle for joy, is called Singing Joy to the World with Intention, Sincerity, and Gratitude. And it's going to be a little bit different as I've actually written out most of this one. <laughs> I know a lot of ministers write out their entire sermons all the time. And uh, most of the time, I use the scriptures as my guide. And of course, I've, you know, I've got a few Bible verses today that I hope you are encouraged by. Uh, like some of the other occasions where I write out my messages uh, are at memorials or what we sometimes would call funerals or celebrations of life, um, and that's to keep me from being insensitive. You know what I mean? Uh, sometimes it's very easy for ministers to kind of go off the, uh, the rails in some of those things, and, and it can be offensive, and um, golly, I, I don't want it to seem today as I read this message that it's... Uh, that it's too robotic, but just bear with me as I read this message to you. And it's a heavy issue on my heart because I grew up singing Christmas carols without intention. So let me begin. Approaching the Christmas season elicits many emotions from previous holiday seasons. These emotions are stirred by pine trees, lights, but perhaps most significantly, Christmas carols. Whether we attend church regularly or are simply C&E churchgoers, remember what that stands for? Christmas and Easter, right? Some people are. They only go to church on, on Christmas and Easter. One thing that is common to most of us is the first verse of these Christmas carols. If the tunes to Hark the Herald, Angels Sing, Joy to the World, or O Come, All Ye Faithful, are played, it can jog our memory enough to sing the lyrics or at least envision them in our minds. But usually verses two, three, and four are not as familiar. Beyond that, and perhaps most sadly, the appreciation for what is actually written and intended in those lyrics is conspicuously missing. Often I wonder if the writers were even aware of what they were writing by communicating what was brought about through the advent of Jesus Christ. But regardless of what the authors intended, let's consider one author's lyrics. The well-known Joy to the World, which was uh, written, the melody, by George Friedrich Handel, who also wrote The Messiah, but the words were written by Isaac Watts. And see if we actually believe what we sing every year during the Christmas season. Familiar to us is this first verse. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. As Christians, we of course believe the Christ, which means anointed one, has come. This speaks of who Christ is. He is the anointed king and high priest foretold by the prophet. Zechariah 9 verse 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you triumphant and victorious, humble, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey, asking ourselves the question, what is true triumph? Do we really believe that he is king Throughout the last 2,000 years, everything around us would seem to say otherwise, primarily because most of us have been raised with the idea that we've, what we physically see represents reality. But Christ indicated that his kingdom is not of this world. John 18, 36 says, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews, but as it is, my kingdom is not from here. And as we read those verses, we have to ask ourselves the question, then what is his kingdom? If it's not military, if it's not physical dominance over other nations, what is that kingdom? The Jews were curious as to when this kingdom would come. So many people, again, 
Continue to ask, when is the kingdom of God going to come? This is what Jesus says about the one kingdom of God. Once Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered, the kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed. It's not something that you will see. They wanted to see the Romans dominated. Jesus said, no. They will not say, look, here it is, or there it is. For in fact, the kingdom of God is within you. Jesus was explicit. The kingdom of God is not an observable kingdom. It is a kingdom that is within us, which makes sense of one of Christ's names. Say it with me. Emmanuel, which being interpreted God with us, Matthew 1, 23, look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Is God with us? Amen. He's right here. This is about the reign of Christ in our hearts. This is what every prophet anticipated. But we now have the New Testament and Jesus Christ to tell us what those prophets meant. This is what Jesus meant when he was asked by Judas, not Iscariot, the one who betrayed Jesus, after Jesus had made it clear that the kingdom would not come with observation. John 14, verse 22 and 23. Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said, watch this. Those who love me will keep my word and my father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. You are the home of Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. You are the home. But what is really wonderful about this, and I want to challenge a little tradition, is that in verse 2 of this same chapter, Jesus talked about the Father's house, which is us. The church is the house of God. And he said, in my Father's house are many homes. It's the same Greek word here, monet. Now, the King James says mansions. And I was raised thinking, well, when I die, I get a mansion. But what Jesus is saying, no, when we come, you will be our mansion. Same Greek word. In my father's house are many homes. In the church are many dwelling places. And the one who loves me, we will come and make our dwelling place with them. Doesn't it feel good to be the home of the Lord Jesus? Amen. It's time we start looking at these things, not with carnal eyes, but with Christ's eyes. Let earth receive her king. Are we willing to admit that Christ is our king now and remove the traditional misconception that the Pharisees had, which was that Christ was supposed to be a military leader to set up a kingdom in order to conquer the existing government, it seems that much of traditional Christianity has embraced the view of the Pharisees. When in fact, Jesus specifically states that his kingdom is not of this world, that it is a kingdom within us, a kingdom of the heart, invisible and eternal. As Paul so clearly states in Colossians, he has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. You are in it now. 2 Corinthians, because we look not at what can be seen, and the context here is speaking about the Old Covenant, temple, ordinances, rituals, in 2 Corinthians 3 through 6, that's the context. We look not at what can be seen, but we look, that's what he's saying, we look at what cannot be seen. He's saying we see things eternal. For what can be seen Old Covenant, temple, high, their high priest, their animal sacrifices, those were temporary. But what cannot be seen, the new covenant kingdom, Christ, the immortal, invisible God. That's what the Bible says. Now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever. We look at those things which are unseen and eternal. 
and heaven and nature sing. This again is not referring to the outward manifestation of literal stars and the sun and moon singing out. Rather, it is a reference to God's people shouting for joy. After all, Paul tells us that we are seated in the heavenlies now in Christ. Now we're there. In Ephesians chapter 2, but God, who is rich in mercy, amen, amen, out of the great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. Nice parenthetical statement there. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. And this is just as the psalmist prophesied. The heavens, which is us, you say what? The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. The heavens represent the church, proclaiming God's glory. And Paul confirms this. I'm not just pulling this out of my hat. Paul confirms this, that this is what the psalmist is prophesying when he quotes this very passage in Psalm 19 in Romans chapter 10. That through the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's people are declaring his glory. We are the heavens declaring Jesus. Verse 2 of Joy to the World elaborates on nature repeating the sounding joy, naming fields, floods, rocks, hills, and plains. All metaphors used in scripture to refer to people. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, and women, of course, we know that. While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. Several verses indicate this praise from such objects. What do they represent? What do they represent? Are we insisting that these objects are physical or are they something deeper and more beautiful that God is speaking about his people? Isaiah 55, we used to sing this at the end of many of the services at Page United Methodist Church in Page, Arizona. You shall go out with joy. Remember that song? We shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. Remember that? We would sing it as if it were fulfilled. It says, you shall go out in joy, be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Amen? That's us. Now, I will say, when you hear wind blowing through these trees, that should elicit the sound of praise to you, because that tree represents you. The Bible calls us trees, remember? Isaiah 62, he calls us box trees, pine trees, fir trees, acacia trees. Psalm 1 says, we are planted as trees by rivers of living water, amen? That's us clapping our hands because of King Jesus. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar, this is all figurative language, metaphorical language, Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Amen. Isaiah even prophesies of valleys being exalted and mountains being brought low. We've talked about this before. In the famous Christmas text, every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain shall be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places plain. Well, Jesus interprets this the following way. Matthew 23, all who exalt themselves, those mountains of pride, they will be exalted or humbled. And all who humble themselves, and Peter quotes this too, will be exalted. Tradition is further challenged. Bear with me here. Tradition is further challenged with the verse three of joy to the world. Do we believe this is fulfilled? I do. I don't say that arrogantly. It took me a long time to get there. I sang this hundreds of times. That's probably an exaggeration because I've only been alive 56 years. 
So, you know, 56 Christmases. <laughs> no more let sins and sorrows grow. Do we believe this is fulfilled? I do. Nor thorns infest the ground. Do we believe that's fulfilled? He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. His blessings flow. What did Jesus say in John 7? The one who believes on me out of his belly shall what? Flow rivers of living water. That's Jesus. That's the blessings, the heavenly blessings. And Ephesians says he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. You're lacking nothing as we will see. What is the curse that Jesus is referring to and Isaac Watts? Genesis 3, and to the man he said, because you listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground. You say, are you really interpreting this metaphorically? Jesus spoke about four types of ground. Do you remember? The parable of the sower. There was the seed that fell by the wayside, the bird snatched it up, the seed that fell on thorny ground, was choked. The seed that fell on rocks, it grew, sprang up real fast, but had no foundation. And then it said, then the seed fell on the good ground. Is that because we're good? No, God had to make the ground good to drink in the rain. Cursed is the ground because of you and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. But what does Paul say about this curse? Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. And I believe it's the same curse, and some people disagree vehemently with me. Being made a curse for us. He was cursed and gave us blessing. The blessings that were foretold in Deuteronomy have come upon us because the curse fell upon Jesus. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. He bore our curse, and we received him as his blessing to us, eternal life. Watts elucidates the reversal of the Genesis curse through the birth of Christ and his death on the cross. Paul says, Christ has redeemed us. Many Christians have a dismal idea that the kingdom of God is about the future removal of physical thorns and briars, as if that is what the curse really was. But when we allow the rest of the Bible to interpret what thorns are, it is evident that in Christ these thorns, sins, and sorrows have been removed through the work of the cross. You say, wait, I still have sorrow. Well, what does the Bible say? Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. You say, but I sometimes cry. Different type of sorrow. He's talking about an eternal sorrow. These were the sorrows that he intended to remove. You are happy in Jesus. You are blessed in Jesus. He has carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. You were not wounded. You were not bruised. Christ was bruised and wounded. The punishment for our peace was upon him. We didn't get punished. Jesus got punished in our place. And with his stripes, we are healed. There's the true healing, amen? Amen. You say, but I have cancer. No, you're healed. It's not about physical healing, folks. You're healed in God's eyes. Amen. Because you have eternal life and are spending eternity with him. So do we really believe that Christ has taken away our sorrows? As quoted above, do we really believe that thorns do not grow anymore? No more let sins and sorrows and thorns infest the ground. Do we believe that it was fulfilled? We sing it. What does the Bible say? Instead of the thorn, right, shall come up the cypress. Remember the trees? 
Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. When you look at the book of Hebrews, as I have elaborated frequently since I've been here, the book of Hebrews is a book contrasting two covenants, old and new, old high priest, old temple, old sacrifices, old altar, old rituals, and then the new and everlasting temple and our eternal high priest Christ. Hebrews uses this language to contrast the difference between believers in Christ and those who are trusting in their own self-righteousness. Now watch, the Genesis language rings clear. The earth which drinks in the rain that comes often upon it and brings forth plants fit for those by whom it is dressed receives blessings from God. He makes his blessings flow, joy to the world. But that which bears thorns and briars is rejected and is a curse whose end is to be burned. Those who trust in their self-righteousness bring forth thorns and briars. It makes us judgmental. It makes us critical. It makes us feel superior. God says that's thorns and briars. Those works are rejected. But those who trust solely in Christ the son of the living God and his work on the cross, drink in the rain, the living waters of Jesus and are blessed of God. And then the last verse, amen. He rules the world, how? With nuclear, no. oh. Sorry. He rules the world with truth and grace. That's what James meant when he said mercy triumphs, triumphs over judgment. He makes the nations prove the glories of whose righteousness? His. And wonders of his love. In other words, when we look around and see the emptiness of those who are trusting in self-righteousness, who are trusting in military power, who are trusting in nationality, in works. We look at that and see their emptiness and it proves to us God's righteousness and his glory. It is difficult to conceive of Christ ruling the world with truth and grace unless we are willing to believe that the world of truth and grace is the world of his people, you and me, ruling with the gospel and not with carnal weapons. It is a kingdom within which is invisible. It's hard to believe that we always rule and triumph. You say, I don't feel triumphant. I don't feel victorious. Yet this is what the song conveys. And the apostle Paul agrees. Do we mean it when we sing it? He rules the world with truth and grace. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians, thanks be to God who, what? Always causes us to triumph in Christ, even when it doesn't feel like it. Even when you make a mess of things, you are still triumphant because the victory is not because of your performance, but because of the cross. Amen. There is the victory. And he makes this manifest when we really believe this and live this triumph out it makes it clear the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. In Christ, Paul says God always causes us to triumph. Christ rules the world with truth and grace, not carnal weapons, as 2 Corinthians 10. Says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. Amen? Through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That's what self-righteousness does. It's an attempt to exalt itself against knowing God and bringing into captivity every thought through what? The obedience of Christ. Not ours, Christ's obedience. Again, thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph in Christ. The key phrase is in Christ. This phrase is vitally important for the Christian to understand all things must be in him in order to be accomplished. But in him, they are indeed accomplished and we are victorious now. 
Read that Romans 8, 37 with me. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And then 2 Corinthians, which was written, by the way, before any of the New Testament was written. And he's talking about the Old Testament promises. He's saying every single one of them is fulfilled about the kingdom of God. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, under the glory of God by us. Again, thanks be to God. We must remember that when Paul wrote this, he was declaring that all the promises of God in the Old Testament are fulfilled. And this is why Paul also wrote, I need this. Do you ever feel incomplete? I do. I feel it. I felt it all this week and the week before. You say, wait, I thought you were the preacher. Yeah. Put yourself in my shoes, right? Everybody's looking at you like, this guy better perform. And then when you don't, how bad do you feel, <laughs> right? I mean, nobody expects Austin to perform, right? Just kidding. <laughs> but we do. It's like we have these expectations of one another. He or she better perform up to my expectations. I don't perform well. Thank God Jesus performed it, and he says, I'm complete in him, regardless of how I feel. Why? Because Christ is the head of all principality and power. Jesus rules. Jesus rules. We are complete in him, even when it does not look like it, feel like it, taste like it, smell like it, or sound like it. We must not base our view on the king of the kingdom on our carnal and empirical experience, but rather on the truth of the word of God, that it is fulfilled when we are in Christ. And as we finish up, joy to the world is a glorious Christmas song, amen, amen. which speaks of the new creation. Not a physical creation anticipated by so many traditional Christians and Jews, but rather a new creation in Christ where the old things of spiritual sorrows, thorns, briars, death, cursing, and sin, they've all passed away. As Paul says, watch what he says here. If anyone is in Christ, that one is a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. Amen. Own that. Believe it and claim it because Jesus' promises are real and true and everlasting. And it's not just joy to the world, by the way. <laughs> Look at that. Peace on earth and mercy mild. This is accomplished. Why? Because of the cross. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. That's the peace it's talking about, not an earthly peace. And the writer of Hark the Herald Angels Sing says, peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconcile. That's what God considers peace. It's not peace between nations. It's a peace with God. All this is from God, Paul says, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Hail the son of righteousness. Is this fulfilled? We just sang it. Life and light to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Do we believe it's filled, fulfilled when we sing it? But where did Chucky get this? Chucky? Charles Wesley wrote, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. <laughs> that makes me so happy. I don't know why. It just does. He got it from Malachi chapter 4. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness, that's Jesus, shall rise with healing in his wings. Peter said, with his stripes we are healed. Amen. You shall go out leaping. That's why I left, I guess. Like calves from the stall. We see a guy leaping after he was healed physically in Acts chapter 4. But man, how much more reason to leap because we have a relationship with Jesus because of the cross. Born that we no more may die. Hark the herald angels sing. Do we believe it? Jesus said, whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes. 
Yes, I do too. Jesus said that. O come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Is it fulfilled? Yes. Paul said, thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph in Christ. Or silent night, holy night, son of God loves pure light. We don't sing that one too often, do we? Radiant beams from thy holy face with the dawn of redeeming grace. Do we believe it's fulfilled that Jesus' face is shining his rays of grace and mercy and triumph on us? Yes, we see his face because we are in the presence of God and the holiest of all. That's where his face is. And Paul shows us this. It is the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the glory, knowledge of the glory of God, what? In the face of Jesus Christ. You say, but I can't see that face. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. It doesn't have to do with your physical eyes. Well, in light of that, we're going to sing joy to the world. So for this Christmas season, I would encourage you to take a new look at the verses you sing and ask yourself the question, do I really believe joy to the world? Do we? It is one thing to sing this song. It's another to mean it. May God show all of us that these things are not things which are a hope delayed that makes the heart sick, as Proverbs says, but rather they are a present reality when we are in Christ. Hopefully this Christmas season will continue on December 26th. And thereafter, as you ponder the joy Christ brings to all those who have trusted in his cross and risen life and presence for the removal of sins and sorrows, and that we rejoice in the abundant life he has now given us. So let's sing this again, okay? And I'm not saying you didn't mean it the first time. But let's mean it a little more. <laughs>